That's okay. That's okay. It happens. It happens all the time. No worries. Folks, good evening. Welcome to FMA Discussion. This is episode 163, and tonight we have the pleasure of having Guru Mark Denny of the Dog Brothers. Thank you, sir. Dog Brother you. Martial Arts. And Dog Brother Martial Arts. Thank you. I appreciate you coming on. Thank you. Just an old man having a good time. Thank you for having me. I got my staff here like this. I'm loosening up some stuff while we talk. Keep going. There we go. Yeah. So uh, we've got a couple questions in and all that. we got a lot to cover. You know, I began your journey. We're going to lead on through, you know, the Dog Brothers and the Dog Brother Martial Arts and what and what you're doing today and maybe what you got coming down the uh, pipeline. So we're going to jump into it. Folks, if you're watching, tell us where you're watching from. Smash that like button and we're going to get started. So um, your first now I understand you in New York City. You graduated from Columbia, if I'm correct. And well, uh, my college was University of Pennsylvania, and then after a semester at a Mexican law school, because I graduated from UPenn in December, so I had an open semester, so I did a semester at La Universidad of Nahuac in Lomas de Chapultepec. Um, that was to get my Spanish better, okay. and then I went back up to New York, and that's where I went to Columbia. Okay, okay. I knew, I knew New York was in there. And then yeah, well, I was born and raised in New York, and piece of trivia, at Columbia, my constitutional law professor was Ruth Bader Ginsburg. No yes. way. We saw things differently, but uh, I got to say, she played fairly with me, and I disagreed with her, you know. Well, that's the way it is in a, in a, in a law school class, is, you know, yeah, the yeah. skill of contesting. And... Um, but, you know, she was, uh, as much as I disagreed with most of her thinking, she was a good personal friend of Justice Scalia. Yeah. You know, and that says something very good about her. And, um, you know, see, even when I disagreed with her, I felt that she played fairly. Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's all you can write. Ask for. No, no. Wow. I would have, wow. Yeah, that was, man. Huh. So coming out of there, and I also did one of my, I, I did a summer at the Fe Antitrust Division of the Federal Trade Commission. And then when I graduated, I went down to Washington and I practiced there for a year before moving out to California. Okay. So when you moved out to California, I mean, obviously, you know, I know you started at the NSL Academy. What, you know, what was that like? Well, to be precise, I started at the Kali Academy. Kali was, Academy. Yeah, okay. which was uh, Seafood Richard Bastillo and Girl Osano. Okay. okay. That was the place on Normandy Boulevard in Torrance. Okay, before it went okay. So tell us about your, you know, what made you, led you going there and what'd you think? I mean, you know. I mentioned being down in Mexico for a semester of law school and after the semester was over, a friend of mine and I, he was he was Mexican and we went on a cruise down, We I had a Chevy that I had bought for $75 in Philadelphia because it was all banged up. The police had been in hot pursuit and so they had broadsided it as part of a hot pursuit and it didn't meet inspection. And the couple that owned it was Israeli and they were going back to Israel. So I bought it for $75 and drove it down to Mexico for you know, my use while I was in, at the school. And so we then took that thing down to, uh, for those who know the geography of Mexico, this, you know, the state of Chiapas, which is the one that borders Guatemala. Okay. And um, while we were there, we picked up these two American girls. And there's a whole story I've told on other occasions. But uh, they're blonde, they didn't have bras on, so they're bouncing along, uh, they're in shorts. And you know, this is a part of the world where Indian women, and it was a heavily Indian area, most people, Spanish is the second language, they have the skirts around the waist that go all the way down to the ankle. So if you see two blondes bouncing along like this and they're in shorts, the locals yeah. get excited. And so four of the locals figured the girls were hookers and they grabbed the girl with my buddy and so a fight started and there's a whole story there. And we wound up running to the police station and they had broken off saying, let's go to the vamos a coche por la pistola. Let's go to the car and get the pistol. So we freak out. We run to the police station. These guys are after us and they have a gun. So when they came roaring up, only then did we realize he was a transit cop and he didn't have a gun. So he ran away. And uh, we barricaded ourselves in the police station and events transpired there. And as we were going out the back window, the state police arrived and forced to see us climbing out the back window of the police station. So Luis and I got thrown in the local prison for three days and stories and adventures in there. But the, bring it, finally coming to your question. So when I got back to New York, it's like, OK, all's well, it ends well, but it's time I really get 
serious about having some abilities. Growing up in New York, as I did during the very violent time, for me, it was a very real issue. Like, okay, I feel that I see those three junkies down at the end of the subway platform are stalking me. It's 3 a.m. We're in the far reaches of the Bronx. I'm on my own here. Or, you know, and there's a variety of incidents of that sort. Uh, or, uh, you know, you know, my second, I got thrown out of a private school and the, the public school I went to was 20% white. My second day on the stairs, I got beat up and robbed. Um, and, you know, other, you know, da, 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 a life, you know, where there's just a lot of incidents like that. And there's finally this one in Mexico is like, you know, I really got to do something about this. And so my last semester at Columbia, there was this guy in the gym by the name of Paul Vizio of Fu Jiao Pai Kung Fu, uh, Tiger Claw which is a genuine okay. Chinese system in New York. They have a lot of iron palm and, you know, so okay. the iron palm and the tiger claw and so forth. Uh, but he, this was when martial art competition was transitioning from the tournament era of Chuck Norris and those guys into the PKA where they had first boxing gloves on and you were only mm -hmm. allowed to kick above the waist and the feet had on those uh, Taekwondo booties or, you know, whatever they should be called, no disrespect intended. And so Sifu Paul at the time was the American champion. He went on to become the world champion in the 132 pound division. Uh, it wasn't exactly what I wanted, but it was what was available to me in that moment. Yeah, yeah. And um, the class started with 36 people and he used it for his own conditioning. By the end of the semester, there were six. And uh, <laughs> at, I, at the start of the semester, I smoked six, <laughs> maybe 12 a day. And by the end of the semester, I didn't. And he um, says, you know, the semester came to the end. I was graduating. I'm going down to Washington, you know, see football. You know, what, what do you think I should do? He says, well, your legs need a lot of work. And so there's this Junri uh, Taekwondo chain down there and, you know, go in there and work on your legs. And so I did that while the year that I was in uh, Washington. Teachers, a guy by the name of Rodney Baptiste who had challenged for the middleweight uh, uh, PKA crown. That's where he fit in things. And then I moved out to California to uh, uh, do real estate with my brother. And um, I've been bitten by the bug. You know, and um, I saw this guy on the beach one day, Long Beach, which is kind of a crummy beach because there's a breakwater and this and that, but that's where I was. So there's no one around. And there's this guy obviously doing some sort of martial art movement. And I go over and I said, you know, you know may I watch? And, you know, struck up conversation. and. Uh, he said, what, you know, interesting what you're doing there. What is that? And in this very mysterious way, he says, it's a modified Wing Chun. And in those days, if you were in Jeet Kune Do, it was on Jeet Kune Do to say Jeet Kune Do. Yeah. You know, one of the Zen Kone kind of a things. So I don't know. Uh, but, you know, it's a modified Wing Chun. And I got to tell you, so he told me about the Kali Academy. So I went over to the Kali Academy and I walk in and there's people waving around sticks and knives. And um, at the time, I didn't know what it was, but there was this Thai guy who had been a pro fighter in Thailand. So he's like five, five, and he's got calves the size of my thighs. And he's whomping on this long bed, which is the first one I had ever seen. This was before Muay Thai had made its presence known on the scene. Okay. I'm like, whoa, and like sticks and knives, and he's busting up that bed. Yeah. And it's like, I have found what I'm looking for. Shazam. And so I began there, and uh, the guy who taught the intermediate class was a guy by the name of Paul Vunak. Mm. And so I started training with him in his backyard, and for a time we were good friends, and actually I was business partner. Uh, you know, he's one-third of progressive fighting systems. Um, but that was, I'd say, from 84 to 86. Okay, okay. And, you know, so... Um, but I, I kept training at this point. Uh, Nasano had his academy, and uh, Sifu Richard had the IMB. And um, so, I, you know, so uh, towards the end there, my, my last year when I was around Paul, two of the guys came in one day and they're all covered with humongous bruises. He says, Good God, what happened? He says, We've been stick fighting. <laughs> what? You know, I look, they're not dead. I'd heard about the death matches in the Philippines. Yeah, they're not dead. Yeah, and um, so, so, you know, why, 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 tell? Yeah, and I says, well, we met this guy, and we put on these helmets, and we went in some hockey gloves, and we went to the park, and we fought with sticks. Said, You're going to do it again? Yeah, I says, well, 
bring me along, let me watch. And so I go along and um, that's how I met Eric. And uh, so of course he talked me into going out there. And actually he tells a story about my first fight with one of these other guys in the first series. And it turns out Eric had also gone to Columbia. He was the undergrad I saw as I was you know, like changing my gear and yeah. whatnot, saying his tricks like, are you went to Columbia? Are you went to Columbia? Blah, blah, blah. And so we hit it off and became good friends. So in addition to the stick fighting, um, he actually, he taught me how to read hands. He's an incredible hand reader. This is not Gypsy Fortune telling you're going to take a trip across the water, oh, but this huh. about who somebody is through their hands. Interesting. Um, you know, simple story I tell to illustrate the point. I was talking to a guy at Roadside Cafe in Arizona. We both go out at the same time. And he had hands. Each one of his fingers was like two of mine. I mean, just, and there on the panel of his pickup truck, tree stump removal. Those are the hands of somebody who goes into tree stump removal. You know, you know, you know, there, there's much more to it than that. But um, I, I noticed that a lot of the, the framework, it uses the terminology of the Greek archetypes. And I have an interest in Jungian psychology, which references the Greek, you know, the, the archetypes of the Greek mythology and so forth. And so for me, this just became a great way of picking up girls because you hold the hand. And you talk about who they are about you. and some yummy and psycho babble bullshit. And I could have girls fighting over me in the bar. You know, I usually get your hand out of here, bitch. He's reading me now. You know? Oh, my God. Oh, it's freaking awesome. Um, but it's really a great conversation because you're saying, who are you? Absolutely. No, no. It's I get just an opportunity for general back and forth engagement instead of the usual twaddle that passes yeah, yeah. ritual in America today. Well, back then, I mean, who, who knows what it is now? Anyway, how did I get here? Oh, how did I get started with stick fighting? So that's how I met Eric. And I said, this is going to be it for me. Because Vunak had said the stick fighting would develop the trapping. And he was very articulate about the trapping. Okay. And so I was looking at, at this point, I'm in my mid thirties, let's see, 86, I would be 34. Mm -hmm. and that's kind of a late start to get into kickboxing. Yeah. But, you know, so this seemed to be a way that I could test my skills in the adrenal state because my interest was those three guys on the subway platform after I drop yeah. off your lawn in the Bronx. I'm not coming at it from young male ritual hierarchical combat. I'm coming at it from a very different conceptual framework. Gotcha. Gotcha. So that is why the Filipino martial arts spoke to me. And, you know, when I first started the Kali Academy, there was Guru Nisano's, uh, the Filipino martial arts books and those essays by Gil Johnson in the beginning, they touched something deep in me, particularly the one about Ron and John Lacosta. Yeah. Because what I liked here, it, it was not, I can kick everybody's ass. I am the supreme alpha. Everybody bow down to me and we have this pyramid. I mean, you know, that wasn't the motivation of the, you know, these guys, and this is what really spoke to me. They walked as warriors for all their days. Mm. And there, and you know, and I have a newspaper clipping somewhere of a name that none of you have ever heard of, but there's this 80-year-old Filipino guy and his wife of 50 years, and he's I think something like 125 pounds, you know, small old Filipino, and some teenage punk was robbing his apartment when he came in, and he happened to have a pipe behind the front door, and he whomped this kid and put a hold on him until the police came and arrested the kid. At 80 years old, he defended his home. And there's a picture of him and his wife. There was external stairs. They were on the second floor. And so he's at the bottom step. Like, let me see if I'm on here. Like, I don't know if I'm on camera here. Let me adjust my camera. Yeah. But, you know, he's got, he's, you know, he's, you know, proudly with his pipe here like this. And his wife is standing next to him in the, the most proudly wife way, resting her hand on his shoulder. And I thought, that is a way to live. Yeah. That is a way to live. But to get to that, you have to have a place in yourself in your prior life, which you tap into. That is the place where you were forever young. Mm. This is the Toby Keith song. I ain't as young as I once was, but I'm as young once as I ever was. Okay. okay. <laughs> right. And, you know, in the Norse mythology, this is where, you know, the story about Odin lost his eye. Odin, yes, I, it, it's been a while, but I know the law. Yeah, but, you know, roughly, you know, a, you know, a riddle contest with the troll of the tree, and, and he won the contest, but in order to drink at the well of wisdom, he had to tear out one of his own eyes. Of his own hand, he had to tear out his eye, and that was the price of drinking at the well of wisdom. Mm -hmm. 
And so when I riff on this, I go, well, why didn't he give his other eye? It's answer, because he'd be blind, dummy. Yeah. You need to save something and using the term in the Norse terminology for when you are for in your life when you are on the plains of Ragnarok. You need to keep something left. And so there needs to be an earlier period in your life where you dive in hard and you pay a price. And you know, the mm -hmm. metaphorical loss of the eye and, and in Odin's case, I've got my injuries. Yeah. But there comes a point where you will be tempted to fool yourself that death is not approaching because you're still doing what you did five or ten years before. No, you're still five or ten years closer to death. Yeah. You know, you know that hasn't changed. But you, we sometimes some of us we try to fool ourselves in that way. Mm -hmm. But there comes a point where whatever durability you have left is for the days on the plains of Ragnarok. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah, no, I like that. Yeah, I like that. No, no, no. So anyway, so that's why I decided to get into it. And uh, in the beginning, I wasn't, and I would, you know, there were 11 of us at, at the Rumble at Rambless. I, because of my role with Paul Bunak and putting together his series at Panther Productions, I had mm. access. Panther Productions was the dominant force. Most of you guys out there have never yeah, heard of Yeah, Black Belt Magazine. Back when magazines were the yeah. internet. Yeah. And uh, Panther Productions had like four, six, eight pages in every martial art magazine out there. Yeah, the yeah. Dominant force. And I put together a deal with them for Paul doing Jeet Kune Do, and it had been a big hit for them. So when I, I went into uh, Joe Jennings, I said, Joe, I got another one for you. And he, and he I said, what is it? Stick fighting? He said, stick fighting? <laughs> I said, look, I brought you Paul Bunak. We made you a lot of money. Trust me on this. And so we negotiated a deal, and that's where he gave us the $50,000 camera, which is what Betacam was in those days, to go out and shoot the footage, which became the bulk of the first series. Okay. And so it was, uh, so the, that first footage was shot in 88. And okay. so in the summer of 1990, uh, somewhere around there, uh, Chris Howder and I had been training partners together at the Inasano Academy for a seminar being put on by Eric Paulson, who at that point, prior, this is years before the jiu-jitsu explosion, yeah. Eric was training with both Hickson and with the Machados and with Yuri Naga Nakamura of shoot wrestling. Phenomenal martial artist, not a name widely known, but those who know him know some serious excellence there. Um, and so he was teaching this grappling seminar. And uh, you know, I'm looking, and we were allowing the grappling in our dog brother fights because it happened. Yeah, right. We didn't right. know what we were doing in the slightest. But yeah, the merge. America and... played defensive end for Columbia University football. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not a very good team, but college level ball. And what is mm -hmm. the personality of a defensive end? Mongo smash little man with ball. Yeah. Um, and he also had been a lacrosse player. Yeah, so lacrosse has a fair amount of contact, and they have a stick which they twirl around and deceive people as Absolutely. they really all about. Yeah. And I think that is why he turned out differently in his move, and he played handball. And so I think those three other variables influence his expression in a fighter in a way that's a lot of people they look at him and so like, why does he move differently from everybody else? So I think those three variables well, are makes sense. He's anyway, so we were allowing the grappling and. Um, Gosh, I'm forgetting his name. Can't believe, but he he was a blue belt in Hawaii under one of the Gracies, and so he you know he had fought with us you know a couple of times when he was in town. So we were intrigued, like there's something there, but we you know we hadn't grasped the essence or in any way. And then so Chris and I, Eric Paulson, and so through Chris, who's now a fifth degree under Higgin Machado, he introduced me to the Machados. And that point, the, all five Machados were all together under one roof. So I've trained with each of them. Uh, my belts are from Higgin, and yeah. um, but you know I have time with each of them, you know, and each has distinctive flavors and so forth. And so that was the summer of 1990. Mm. And with only nine lessons, I came to fight with it for the first time. And um, in that time, and my father had died just a few weeks before, so I was in a very special place. Okay. And um, and things went very well for me using the jujitsu, only with nine lessons. But if you have the map and the other guy doesn't, yeah, yeah. Oh, here's the six foot, you know, like the first time I fought uh, Mike Tibbetts, later to be Dogzilla. Ugh, you know, six foot, 245, ex Marine, uh, federal corrections officer on the cell extraction team, if you understand what that means. Mm. You know, formidable guy. And so what did he do? He said, I don't know what to do with this stick. So he just bows in and he knocks me on my ass. 
And just because of these nine lessons, I'm like, okay, this is where I now put my legs around the waist. And he goes, whoa, with all the confidence in the world. And I just kind of slipped it. And then I spun him within my guard so that I now had my chest to his back and I put the choke on. Oh, you got, oh, he has back. Whoa, what was that? Because they're okay. expecting me to get my ass kicked. Yeah. And, you know, so that's where things started turning around for me. And I started developing the jujitsu in the context of the Dog Brothers fighting. Eric's like, what you've been up to, Mark? And so I turned them on to the Machados. And that's where Arlen, who was in Santa Fe, with Brazilian jiu-jitsu had not arrived there yet. Yeah, yeah. So that's where he went into the Kribi Krabong to have a way to make it harder for Eric and me to come in with the Brazilian Yes, jiu-jitsu. he mentioned that in his interview. Now, Eric yeah. always had formidable closing game. His flying roof to the thrust. Um, you know, you know, the speed, the power, the drive, he's got really powerful legs and that whole defensive end of coming in now, kind of an attitude. And so, um, on the other hand, Arlen had a very good natural insertion of the checking hand to break that up. So the two of them, two heavyweights back and forth and, you know, but I could never impose the close on Arlen. I had to wait for him to get tired of me trying to pop shot his hand and then run at me and grab me. And so that's Mm -hmm. what he did that after those nine lessons you know poon and girl edgar had shown me i would had a trouble with him because arlen raises up here and then if you defend high is here and if, uh, you know you drift underneath otherwise it's from the derobio system mm-hmm. and you know so and i showed the footage to poon and girl edgar i'd started training with him in 89 and um showing the first i always had trouble with this guy which i do he says oh for him it is easy you keep your hand higher than his that's freaking brilliant when you're fighting, that's the kind of insight that you need. And he had that quality. In other words, if I'm here like this, I have to choose whether to defend the head. And that's when I get deceived with the drift shot to the leg. Okay. And so Punagor Edgar showed me the illustrissimo cross step, which also solves that. Okay. But with the hand higher, no matter what he does, all I have to do is drop. Right. That's a powerful insight. And so when I got in front of Arlen, you get in the foot, this is on the tape. You just see me, I'm not sure what I'm doing, but I'm just sort of waving my stick around up here. And he's like, what's it doing up there? Fuck it, excuse me, screw it. He just runs in and grabs me by the head and throws me down. And in the nine lessons that I had with the Machados, I was with, uh, Carlos was working with me. And normally they start with counters to mount, but because of the fang choke, that's done principally from Kesa Gatami. So they were showing me both sides of Kesa Gatami. Oh, all right. Okay. Right. You know, because that's where we're applying the fang chips. So the progression is there. So, so when somebody grabs, I said, this guy, you know, he's way stronger than me. Arlen, his power lifting numbers were in the 1600s. Yeah. Serious strong. Serious strong. And Eric's description of him is he's a pachyderm, meaning, you know, an elephant like, <laughs> you know, that, you know, he doesn't feel hits the way ordinary mortals do. Oh, my God. Pachyderm. And, um, and you know just a, a, an incredible durability there and you know you know which I, without which he you know couldn't have had all the fights with eric that he did so anyway so he grabbed and he would always grab with the um the left hand most people grab with the right hand the stick hand but he uh-huh. always would grab with the left and so he torqued me down and what carlos taught me was if somebody grabs you by the head you say to your, this to yourself good he has just given you his back Okay. So it is this, the thinking that is where the difference is. Until, you know, like, if, you know, all I had to know was when Dogzilla, my, the future Dogzilla was knocking me on my ass, throw the legs around the waist and use the legs to neutralize his balance yeah. and, and so forth. All I had to know was if somebody grabbed me by the head, instead of thinking he's bigger and stronger than me and he's twerking me down and he's punching me in the face, wham! It's like, this is awesome. I'm on his back. Yeah. I mean, the, you know, the mindset change is total. And so I got Arlen twice that day. And that's what you've been up to. And, you know, so that was the beginning of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu coming into uh, Dog Brother fighting. Now, also, I claim I am the man who introduced Gurren Asano to the Machados. Oh, I, okay. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, the Gracie attitude, this is back, you know, Gracie Jiu Jitsu, we're the best, we're number one, you know, very alpha, who's the king of the beach kind of a, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, mentality. And that doesn't resonate for girl. And, um, but, you know, I said to him, girl, these guys, girls having tremendous back problems, you know, from some terrible sea lot throws. 
I said, this is going to be good for your back. All these guys got really healthy waists and really healthy hips. Mm. And, you know, but, you know, he's, he was, you know, he's like, for him, the word jujitsu was the memory of his uncle Vincent using him as a throwing dummy. Yeah, so he, yeah. So he just figured I was crazy. Like, Mark, what are you trying to get me into? Right. And, uh, but I brought Higgin around and Higgin's got a very relaxed, mellow personality. And they all do that, you know, there's that really, but Higgin in particular. And so girl resonated to him very comfortably. And then I brought him to one of the after class dinners another night. And again, you know, so they got to feel each other about and girl just felt comfortable with him. Mm -hmm. And so the phone rings, and he calls us, he says, Mark, I said, yes, girl, this is Dan Inasano. Yes, girl. He says, you really think this jujitsu would be good for my back? And I said, yes, girl. You know, so I figured like, well, my rep's on the line here. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, and set up a lesson and so some back and forth with me, you know, setting it up. And uh, it was at six o'clock in the morning at Higgins School, which didn't have a sign. And so it was behind the donut shop and the shopping center kind of a thing. I mean, and so I left my house at four to go pick up Guru at his house at five to get him to the lesson by six. And so it starts with like, okay, escape from out, but girl's back was so messed up. He couldn't mm -hmm. even do an upa with no one on him. Right, right. And so this is where the connection really, where the hook was set. And Higgins says, oh, and I had said to Higgins the night before, and he says, you know, Higgins, he's got bad back. You got to be careful here. He says, don't worry, Maka Danny. I know how to teach old people. And um, so anyway, so in this moment, Higgins says, he says, don't you worry, Donnie. We're going to jump that one for now. You don't fit jujitsu. Jujitsu fits you. Mm. And so that's where Gurf felt that he could trust him. And he also saw the influence. Roger Machado has some awesome yoga jujitsu blend, which comes from a guy by the name of Orlando Kani with Gymnastica Natural. He had gone to India and brought back the yoga and fashion oh, okay. exercises with which the Gracie family was trained, the Gracie family, including the Machado brothers. Mm. Blah, blah. Um, and so, you know, he was found by finding a lot there that, you know, he really liked. And so Higgin put him to work shrimping. And it was out of the shrimping that he reclaimed his back. Okay. And he came to me a couple, a few months later. He says, Mark, I want to thank you for saving my back. Oh, nice. And okay. I was like, ah, you know, you, know, you feel good. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. So anyway, so I brought the Brazilian jiu-jitsu in. And, uh, you know, that became a real forte for me. And at the same time, I had had uh, in 1992 in jujitsu class, the six foot seven guy stepped on my foot while he was accidentally, while he was sweeping the leg and my knee had been, was snapped out to the side and I lost the ACL, the PCL and the lateral collateral. This is at 40 years of age. Yeah, real serious. You get it. And I had it. Yeah. So I was thrown off my stride for quite a bit. Instead of being ahead of the curve on the jujitsu wave with relation to Eric, I was now way behind. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is when I edited the first series is when I was laid up from the, because it took three surgeries to get it right. So as I was coming out of that, I never had physically spectacular footwork. And now, so even less as I'm trying to reclaim yeah, reclaim half and everything. And so I got to thinking, where are all these damn triangles that I hear about in, in the Filipino market? Mm. The only one I could think of was to do this. That was the only triangle I could think of. And the rest of it was lean in, lean out, smash and bash. Uh, uh, you know, you know, where's it, you know, where is all the art that has been practiced all this time? And, um, what occurred to me is that the, the I got to stand up again. Is why do I want? What was my limit? Uh, where am I going here? Oh, yeah, my limitation is that I felt I had to keep the right foot in front. That if I had the left foot in front, I was going to get lit up on this side. Mm. Issues of reach. Now later on, we learned from Arlen. This is now what we call off lead. The other foot forward. Arlen brought from Pravi Krabong, well here, this is a staff, but let's pretend it's a stick. That by having the tip here like this, you can cover all of these angles like this. And at the same time, you really get a long, powerful strike by leaping with the rear leg, raising the rear knee high. And so there's a, there's a tremendous range to the strike and a tremendous shield. So you can fight with this foot forward. But I didn't know that at that time. 
And so what did occur to me, I says, well, I've been doing all these double strict drills all these years, and I seem to have an affinity for it. My mother's a lefty, and going back to the hand reading riff, you know, we have uh, the lines in our hands are almost identical. Mine are deeper, you know, man's hands versus a woman's hand kind of a yeah. thing, but we have the same patterns of lines in our hands and approximately the same shape. And uh, so I've always had affinity for working both sides. I used to pick up some pocket change in college, uh, shooting pool and playing ping pong. And I would, you know, start the night playing left-handed. And as the money got bigger, I would play right-handed. Uh, <laughs> you know, which is good fun. Anyway, you know, and just I notice in things that I do, I shave left-handed for some reason, other thing, you know, that, uh, um, and so I really started working on double stick. And what that does is it quadruples the amount of triangles. It doesn't double them, it quadruples them. You have right to right, right to left, left to left, left to right. You have four times as many triangles. And so with the intelligence of that, I now had just like jujitsu had given me a map of physical interaction. Yeah. Guard, pass guard, side control, knee control, mount, back control whichever side of them you're on, but you have this mental map of where you want to, mm. which, you know, and the, if the other guy doesn't have it and you do, that's really, yeah. um, you know, a powerful thing, you know, after, but, you know, of course, pretty much everyone now has the, has the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu map, but when the, and here's one of the things I'd like to say, advantage is temporary. The search for it is eternal. Yeah, yeah, the advantage is temporary. Right. I like yeah. advantage is temporary. The search for it is eternal. So there was a time there where, with Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, with me as an ordinary blue belt on the Dog Brothers field, everyone's like, "Watch out for Mark. He's this really big." Yeah, he's gonna take your, He's gonna take you. Like, yeah, like, yeah, we roll bark, you know. Um, <laughs> but uh, so I started developing things with my double stick game, you know, because I had a certain affinity there, and with the intelligence of how to play the triangles and the angles. Um, okay. And that is what laid the foundation for the Kali Tudo and the Die Less Often material. And uh, okay. one of the claims of the Filipino martial arts is that the empty hands are just like the movements of the weapons. Yeah, that's right? right. We've heard this, right? Yeah. So, and, and look at your expression. Look at your reaction. Do you believe <laughs> that? I know. No. Do, you believe I, that? I, do yes, I believe that? Hmm? No, no, I don't. Not fully. No. Yeah, right. And so I got to thinking, well, what's going on here? Why is that? And it occurred to me, the problem was this. First, you will do in the adrenal state what you have tested in the adrenal state. Mm -hmm. So if all your Filipino martial art training is the void of adrenal training, when you're in an adrenal state, no way will you go to it. You will go to, if you've wrestled, you're going to look to wrestle. If you've boxed, yeah. you're going to look to box. If you've played football, you're going to look to play football. Yeah. You're going to do what you have tested adrenally. That is the point of sport in game, is to mm -hmm. have a way of testing certain qualities in the sport state, in the combat ritual space, in case you ever have to step outside of it into the world of die less often. Yeah. Right? And so, uh, here, I'm sorry, I need a sip of water here. Give me a moment. Sure, sure, sure. So the first reason, in my, my way of analyzing this, that we don't see people using Kali movements in, for example, MMA, let's put aside the excuse of it's too deadly. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know, I, you know, we've all seen that dance from the early days of the UFC and like, no, it's just you couldn't fight. Uh, yeah. But um, at least against that structure, mm -hmm. and, you know, they've never seen that, you know, things evolve, things evolve. So anyway, um, oh, gosh, I'm getting on tangents here. Oh, yeah. So it hadn't been tested adrenally. And one reason it hadn't been tested adrenally had to do with the genetic stock that tends to go into different martial arts. At that point in time, we're now talking about the 80s and then, you know, yeah. the 90s, um, people who were athletic competitors, guys who would want to test themselves by fighting, they would go into boxing, into Muay Thai, into judo, mm -hmm. into wrestling, into jujitsu, into football. That's a distinct, you know, that is the jock 
Yeah, the job. Right, right. Yeah. The people who went into Filipino martial arts tended to be smaller and they wanted to impress. Look at how dangerous I am. And on some level, and I'm being aggressively sarcastic here, but I think the point is a fair one. It's like a toad puffing up his air sac to look big. Yeah, that's a good analogy. Yeah. And so if that is the gene pool that you're calling on and they've never tested it adrenally, of course, they're not going to test it. You try to use it for the first time. Hmm. And the other thing that I think happened is, uh, particularly in those days, most people fought single stick. Whereas my best fighting came after the recovery from my knee injury. That's where I really came into my own prior to that. Yeah. Oh, interesting. That's that's really interesting. Interesting. I'm pretty proud of the fighting that I did. But huh. um, that is where I had fought as a double stick fighter. So if you're trying to use, oh, let me adjust the camera angle a little bit. Sure. Mine too. There we go. Yeah, okay, that'll do roughly. If you're just trying to do single stick stuff like this, how are you going to fight somebody who's got all bringing all of that? Right. Not going to happen. Oh, I'm going to do a gunting. Okay. Bullshit. Right. Uh, <laughs> um, but if you are used to working with two sticks and hitting out of those structures, mm. now you're something different. Now, it makes sense to me, and because, and because that's how I'm hitting with this, not just forehanded thrust, but I now can be doing, you know, I'm integrating the backhands, and I'm coming on all kinds of lines, which he's not necessarily familiar with. And I Correct. get to hit two hits per shift of body weight instead of the one of the box. Yeah, the so two hits per, per shift. I get you. Yes. And in that moment I put that I pull the trigger, I overwhelm his neurological system. Mm. In that moment, what do I do when I have advantage? I take advantage. He right. is the turd. I am the smell. Wherever he goes, there I am. Yeah. By so doing, I step through the portal to the magical dimension where martial arts and crafts actually work. Yeah. <laughs> I and so that was the, the, you know, so I'm now, that's the crystallization of what I've been working on a lot of years there. Mm. So I came into like, that is where. When the question was presented, why don't we see it in the cage? I said that, you know, the other ones, oh, it's too dead laugh. Like, no, damn it, that's a good question. Yeah. We need to, we, you know, and so the answer I came up with is logic of adrenal experience. And to the extent that anyone did, for example, they fought at a dog brother gathering, they tended to be single stick. Yes. And so I retired from the stick fighting at 48, year 2000. And then shortly thereafter, I met Rico Ciparelli over at Hagen Machado's Jiu Jitsu School. Do you know the oh, name Rico Ciparelli? I remember him. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. World wrestling champion under Dan Gable, and he was the head coach for the Raw Gym, which was Frank Trigg, Vladimir Matushenko, Leoto yeah. Machida, Waleed Ishmael, world class gym, and you know for a number of years there. Yeah, yeah. And Rico was intrigued by the stuff that I was doing with this, and so he invited me over, and so I got the these guys. They dial it down to my level. I mean, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm already you know 50 years, 48, 50 years old. You know what would be the point of smashing me? But they were kind of intrigued by what I was doing, and I got that we held our gatherings there for a few years. And so that was a place for me to experiment and really lay the foundation for the Kali Tudo. And, and both Rico and Frank spoke for it, you know, when I released the first one, and I've been continuing to develop it over time. And what that does is something very important for the third area of Dog Brother Martial Arts. The third area of Dog Brother Martial Arts is the interface, die less often, the interface of gun, knife, and empty hand. Okay. It, okay. So for that, for example, if I'm a, you know, I'm a scurrilous kind of a guy and you see my weight shift like this and the hand drifts behind, yeah. you know, like this, what he's going to do, Nate? Yeah, you're not getting, you're not getting your wallet. Question. Is it a fist yeah. or is it a knife? That's right. I know. I know. Right. Which one of those is it? And so uh, you don't have time to identify in the realities of some escalating no. conversation. Oh, I'm going. Oh, I can. I, I, I can do a cover. Oh no! Now I need to do a you know a redirect into the disarm. And, you know you can't choose. No, you, I know. You don't and know so what, what you need to have, and here's the key point: the same idiom of movement whether you are empty hand or you do, or weapons may be involved. Mm. And so that with the taking the, the weaponry movement from my double stick 
and adrenalizing it in the empty hand context of combat sport of mixed martial arts, that's our laboratory for this method. Okay. We then take that across to the third area, which is the die less often. Die less often. Okay, I remember hearing that. Okay. Wow. And so, so that segues into how I wound up here at Vigilance Combatives in Aberdeen, North Carolina. Mm. Sean, he's a fifth degree problem guy, this and that. And it's, I, uh, as we, uh, for those who don't know, he's got two bronze stars, Purple Heart. Uh, he was on some of the highest level raids in Iraq, like capturing, you know, the guys who were on the 52 cards. I mean, yeah, I remember you telling anybody me that. has been around that stuff understands what those words mean. Yeah, yeah. And um, so, you know, it's not always, but, you know, sometimes in room clearing, it gets very close. No, no. And yeah. um, so he, he brings that to his experience. And see, so also something, you know, the war is a many faceted thing. So picture... Uh, I know a lot of people don't follow these things that closely, but there was a time where things were going very badly for us, and then we had a change of strategy, and we persuaded the Sunnis to come over to us. The mm -hmm. Sunni awakening, it, it was called. That was General Petraeus's strategy and so forth. Mm -hmm. That's where President Bush decided to double down. So it was a very pivotal moment. And so in that moment, there's meetings going on as people are considering changing sides. So picture you know, a meeting of people like that. Everybody in the room has killed plenty of people. Yeah. I mean, you, know, you, know, for the, you know, most of us have, you know, like, you know, you know, that's outside of our comprehension. And, you know, and yeah. are, are we going to be on the same side or is this, is, are we just setting up an ambush here? Mm. Are you setting up an ambush here? So very high level intensity to the meetings. And so he's developed this body of material that he calls table manners. Okay, remember you mentioned that. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, the table manners arose out of this. So he's taking some of the things that he's, you know, that Prabhu Maga teaches, but now he's bringing. It's been seasoned by a level of interaction and understanding that few have experienced. Mm. And this material also carries over to vehicle fighting. What if you have a problem with your passenger? What if, yeah. you, you know, you know, what are the tactics between front and back seat and stuff like that? And so some of the table, you know, it trans the world. We also, we have a fight car. It's just mm. a total junker. The tires are all, yeah. and it sits out behind the school. And so you can go in there and, you know, you know, you know, show like, okay, here's the strategies, here's the tactics. Um, and, you know, so, you know, so on, on the last day of the camp, there's going to be, for those so inclined, you know, gear up and so forth. And everybody should stay calm. I mean, you know, yeah. you know, and so forth. But, uh, you know, sort of exercise it a bit. And so we'll be doing that with the table manners and with the vehicle fighting. And the theme of the camp is dealing with a cranky crowd of scurrilous scum. <laughs> and we've seen a lot of cranky scurrilous scum crowds this past year. And um, uh, yeah, depending on a lot of people, like you know, just uh, well, a lot of people don't get. Uh, here's a way of thinking about it. Well, yeah, here I'll, I'll, I'll tell a story. Um, I was in Pendecker Paul de Tours, a uh, Bukti Nagara Penjak Silak class at the Inasano Academy in the late 80s, you know, like 86, mm. 87, somewhere around there. Baron Asano was training with him, and he had a class for us. I said, Shit, if Girls taking a workout. Right, right. And um, the, anyway, so, you know, some of the stuff you look at it, you know, you're doing the forms and it's, yeah. You know, you know, here I am, you know, in my early stick fighting days and I'm looking at this and I'm going, really? <laughs> <laughs> and so we're all seated there one day and Pindecker there. And he's got playful sense of humor. And listen, I need a volunteer, Mark. So he calls me up, and I'm standing there like this, and he gets this far for me, and he says, "Do something." <laughs> and in that moment, I realized two things. One, the most important one was I didn't have jack shit for that. I was used to this. Yeah. I was used to this, but I had jack shit for do something. Right up. Yeah. And then as I thought a bit more about it, I says, wait a minute. 
that move now makes a whole bunch of sense. I'm coming up both sides outside of his peripheral vision, and I'm stomping his knee sideways and then twisting him down. That's not a bad move when someone's at me nose to nose. Yeah, no kidding. That's yeah. And so the deeper lesson I think is this: is there's different paradigms of fights. Mm. And so whenever we look at something, we have to say, what is the problem being solved? Like that. And so with the table manners, a lot of us, you know, hey, I got a great, you know, deep X guard or you know whatever it is. But if somebody's standing over you as you're seated at a table. Okay, that's a new question to you. That I you know, yeah. says, well, here's what I've used, and it worked out pretty well. And I shoved him here, and then I shot him. You yeah. know? <laughs> uh, and so that is one of the things that is part of the skill set here, is that this is a firearms-friendly school. Uh, there's, you know, We use airsoft. Let's see, it's off camera here, but like right up here on the wall. Oh, there we go. Yeah, you know, this is you know, an AR-15, you know, airsoft, and we, we have, you know, and where is it? Oh, you must, I got put away down there, but there's also airsoft Glock 19s. Oh, and okay. so you can get in the repetitions, you know, and then the mechanisms are all the same. And so... You want to get a little more water? Sure. But now we're integrating the draw stroke into the fight. You know, so for example, you know, so you know, I had the uh, see which one was this? I think this one was dial less often three, where I show that my version of the of the fence, and you know, for how to get behind him and give him a shove. Now you got your draw stroke. Oh, clear space to draw. Okay. okay. Yeah. You know, now you clear the space, get behind him. You know, mm -hmm. how do you get behind somebody who's in your face? That's a good trick. There's various ways of doing it. Um, and it's easier to fight people from behind than in front. Oh, yeah. Nice. This goes to what is the problem being solved? What kind of fight are we in? Four basic categories of human aggression. Territory, hierarchy, reproduction, males for the female, female in defense of the young, uh, and predatory, give me your wallet. I'm taking mm. In the area of ethnology, which is this area of science, uh, aggression is assigned to, defined as within a species. So a lion hunting a gazelle would not be aggression. Right. But a human saying, give me your wallet, because it's intraspecies and it's a predatory behavior. And so it's like, okay, what kind of aggression are we dealing with here? And most martial arts is about young male ritual hierarchical combat. Yeah. You know, some version, you know, it's, uh, let's say, well, we got to be the same size and we got to have this, you know, we got to have agreed upon rules. Mm. We might have a referee to make sure everybody respects the rules. Yeah. And so what that is, is a place that in the adrenal state, you can test yourself, but at the same time, it sets up a dynamic where the loser is not lastingly damaged. Mm. A hierarchical fight should not weaken the social unit by damaging the loser because that's everybody's detriment. So, yeah, it's over. You know, blah, 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 blah. we clear. Yeah, we're clear. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah, take my hand. Let me buy you a beer. You know, that's yeah. the, it, a quintessential dynamic. It's not often, you know, not always that smooth, but you yeah. know, that's the theoretical ideal. Um, that's a hierarchical dynamic. And so, if we are in social dynamics, which are where the lines of what is the unit, what is the tribe, what is the pack is blurred, that's where you can have some serious misunderstandings trip off and things get out of hand. You know what? So now Ooh. this is where part of the intelligence is to have good, well thought out set of rules of engagement. All right, let's play the vid. Do you mind, sir? See, I worked that in for you. Uh, you know what? I was just gonna say, man, that was pretty smooth. I gotta get. I gotta get. I have a crafty dog. Yeah, I gotta uh, get. Crafty. Right, so you gotta play that now. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Folks, watch I'll, this. I'll go drink some water while you're doing that. Sure, sure. All right. So, in my teaching, uh, I emphasize well, what are your rules of engagement. engagement. Uh, you know, you know, my rules of engagement, good manners are good policy, you never know who you're messing with. Uh, 
uh, uh, avoid, avoid the three S's, stupid, stupid people in stupid places, places doing, doing stupid things. things. And then, and then, then the, 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 the first three, you can keep coming up with more, but the big three are uh, what, what you think of me is none of my business. In the tribal, the tribal context, context in which the human animal evolved, evolved respect, respect is very, is very important. important. If you, if you accept, accept disrespect from others in your group, group you're, you're going to be last, last in line for food, food and, and the ladies, the ladies aren't going to find you very appealing as a mate. Uh, uh, but, as but as we get, we get into the modern world, world we're in a lot of situations where we're in what might be called anonymous interactions. You have some interaction with somebody you've never met before or will never see again. Why does, Why does respect, respect matter? matter? So you're so wired to respond to the disrespect, but in point of fact, by uh, uh, winning in criteria, criteria, getting involved with him doesn't, doesn't make sense. So there's this inherent underlying tension. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I think one of the things that the Dog Brothers experience offers is that you have this place that you can test yourself and that you know who you're about so that if and when you need to uh, turn, away turn away from somebebody somebody who's you know just being disrespectful or abrasive or, abrasive or, whatever, or whatever that you, think that you don't, don't doubt yourself that you don't doubt your courage you just know what I could afford I know what it is to fight but it's just not an intelligent choice you know in this context but if I do have to fight I know what I can do and those around you for example you know your woman your family uh, your friends, uh, your friends if they, if they know you can fight and they see you turn away, they're not going to wonder, wonder if you did it out or cowardice. They're going to know, hey, that, that guy, guy was lucky that you were so calm. That was, man, that was that, the S's. I like that. That was, that was good. So with the right rules of engagement, that then brings you to something very important, which is if somebody pushes past those lines, this is now, by definition, a fight you can't lose. Mm. Back in the early days of the UFC, when Hoist was kicking ass, his brother Horian, who was the business guy, I mean, he's also a great black belt, but, you know, um, he had a column in Black Belt Magazine, and he had one, one, uh, one uh, month was dedicated to all the excuses that people were coming up with as to why Hoist was kicking their ass. Okay. And the two most common ones were, I wouldn't let him get that close to me. I would just stick and move. And so he addressed that. And the other objection what people had was, well, you wouldn't want to do that against more than one in the street. And Hoyce's, uh, uh, um, his, uh, his comment was, you can't fight one person. What are you worried about more than one? <laughs> Now, that's very witty, but guess what? That's actually very mistaken thinking, and I'll tell you why. If there's more than one, weapons are going to get used. Yeah. Yeah, equally, yeah. yeah. And that witty answer, and there's wit to it, but it is completely from the hierarchical mind. This mm -hmm. is the mind that sees the definitive fight, the definitive purpose of the training is kicking the ass of some guy on the beach in Rio because he disrespected Gracie Jiu Jitsu. <laughs> right? You, you recognize that from the first, you know, that, you know, Gracie Jiu Jitsu in action. It is the quintessential hierarchical mindset. And you got to be real clear what is the problem you're looking to solve? Mm. Um, there was a Muay Thai champion, I, you know, I forget of what circuit or whatnot. His name was, I think, Alex Gong in California. And so Alex is in his gym and he's in his tie shorts and he's whomping on the heavy bag. And somebody sideswipes his car. He runs outside in his Muay Thai shorts, all sweaty, with his straps on. And the car is caught at the traffic, the sideswipe him is caught at a traffic light. So he comes running up to the guy, you know, like this. He's upset. This guy looks up and shoots him and kills him. I heard. Like car I heard. thief in the middle of trying to get away. I know. Hierarchical yeah. mind will get you in trouble. Yeah, There's the footage that we played in uh, Die Less Often 3. Um, and it has uh, a really tall guy and a really short guy. And the tall guy is looming over the short guy and he's got him backed up against the pool table. And after a while, the, you know, the short guy's like, hey, <laughs> like this. And so he reaches into his pocket, he takes a knife, 
and he sewing machines them up the side, drives them across the bar, repeatedly sewing machining him. And then as the guy staggers and falls to the floor, he turns and runs out of the bar. No one gets up, no one moves. No one does a thing to help this guy who's just gotten pumped. He gets up, he staggers across the bar, doesn't in room, doesn't quite know what to do. He's in shock. He sits down on a bar stool and then falls over dead. Yeah. Big guy's like, I am dominant. You must bow down to me because you were small. Yeah. Well, if you're a small guy who may have done some time in prison, that kind of disrespect, accepting that kind of disrespect means you're going to be the bride of cell block D, not yeah. an option. Yeah. Well, you're big. I'm not. Guess what? I'm going to use this. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you made a Darwinian error. Doom on you. But I will not be disrespected. Different understandings as to what rules, you know, no. rules engagement are. Great point. Great point. Yeah. So with the Filipino martial arts, so I'm sort of you know, I'm trying to work with the question the the questions you scout. Sure, you're, sure, you're, sure. Out from me here like this. What Goran Asana organizes it is that there's twelve areas. You know, you know, you know. I'm going to garble them. I'm sorry, girl, if you ever happen to be listening to this, but he knows me. He knows I'm really bad at this stuff. But you know, there's single, there's double, there's long and short. There's you know, single knife, double knife. There's mm. those monos, um short and long. There, there's empty hand. I think I already did long and short. Um, anyway, but he, you know, there, you know the healing category. There's a spiritual category, mm -hmm. and uh, the one I left as there's a projectile category. So obviously, yeah. firearms were not very evolved yeah. when we think of the Filipino martial arts being developed. But they were there. You know, they made their appearance. Uh, you know, think of the, uh, the the Filipino independence movement coming out of the uh, aftermath of the Spanish American War. And, you know, we don't need to go into that history. Um, mm. you know, I'm certainly not qualified to discuss it other than to say it happened. Right. Um, but uh, the logic of, of my lineage uses the term Kali, you know, coming through Gurnasano and Manon La Costa. I know for some people that's controversial, but they'll get over it. I already have. And but the logic there is to be able to walk as a warrior for all your days. You know, for example, there's a system, the Cabarroa and Escrima system under uh, Grandmaster, Grandmaster Ramiro Estelilla. Yes. Wonderful man. But the system's logic is the logic of a group, a bunch of, of villagers who want to be able to work together as a team for when the bandits come to steal their harvest. Mm. So that's a very different kind of a system. You know, or, you know, then you look at like the logic of systems, you know, uh, I, I have a small amount of very treasured time with uh, uh, Grandmaster uh, Leo Haran, uh, the fame, you know, the World War II experiences. Yeah, uh, and we have a 30 minute documentary based on it around an in, of him based around an interview I did in his training hall in his basement. And it's like, ah, oh, see here, this is where I parried his arm at the, you know, his. And it, I, I miscalculated. I did the by at the at the bayonet on the rifle. Then I cut him off, his arm off at the elbow, and I sent him to the guy, you know, to my you know the yeah. formation. I sent him to this guy here to finish the kill. So, I mean, you know, that's a different kind of system. You know, you know, you know. You read his book, Memory Ride: The Edge of Tide, and there's there's all kinds of jungle fighting gems in there. You know, like the issues about being on a hillside. Whether do you want to be above or below? Yeah, it might actually be better to be below because you can take the legs and it's easy to duck out of the way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, da 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 da. So there's all. It's a very broad range of systems. So there's a place for somebody like me who wants to have a place. While I was still a young man, I had a late start in martial arts. I didn't start till I was 29. Yeah. That's a very late start. You know, most people who go into this is is their is their life. You know, they usually started at knee high to a grasshopper because there's a certain mm -hmm. quality that comes from that. But, um, you know, I was able to get in, you know, some adrenal time, you know, through my dog brother experience. And that is what I look to touch should I ever have to operate and die less often. Mm. That, you know, but that is it is my dog brother fighting experience that is the place in me that is forever young. I did it in the ritual space but I search for the totality of ritual and reality. So when I get down here to vigilance and I interface with Sean and his experience outside the war wire at war 
and bringing it back here, there's a, you know, there's a tremendous synergy, psychologically, emotionally, spiritually, as well as physically. His brace shapes, you know, from Krav Maga, well, that comes out into my chupacabra structure and some of the, you know, things that happens with the, you know, the Kali Salat hands. So it, it, you know, it goes together really well. We're having a great time experimenting and, and, you know, working things out. And then there's the challenges of like, okay, if you have on a war belt, you know, what are your most get up? How do you best get up when somebody's on top of you? Oh, we have a belt on, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then those belts, are, you know, war belt is bigger than a policeman's belt. Mm. So, you know, that's one we're working on now and, and stuff like that. And uh, and then I have some uh, gun knife integration material, uh, which is what I was working with uh, when I was working uh, in Jordan. And, you know, I, you know, we're starting to introduce it here. And there, uh, there's a problem arisen. So, ah, we got to work this out here. So we're in a moment of, you know, research on it. But, you know, I think there's a pretty interesting uh, gun knife uh, integration category. And, um, you know, just always something going on. So the camp, July 24th to 26th, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. The Monday will be the action day. Um, and, uh, you know, people are signing up when we get, you know, when we have 10 people, then there'll be the option of, uh, you know, some sort of group rate at the hotel for people who want to sleep at the mat here at the school. That's an option. Mm -hmm. uh, very nice area here. And you basically, you fly into Raleigh and it's a one hour drive, you know, one hour, yeah, drive. And it's a 70 minute drive you know, from the Raleigh airport. Very, very simple, very direct. Okay, wow. Well. We got a few questions uh, from viewers, and uh, one of them is, "What you know? What other Kali system did you train in besides the Asanal blend? And what did you? What uh, benefits did you gain from them that maybe you perhaps implemented in DBA or just for yourself or hmm. whatever?" Okay, good question. Uh, obviously, my principal system is in Asano blend. I'm a private student of Guru and Asano. Um, I have, uh, I'm a formally admitted member of the Pekiti Tersha family. I have time with Grand Tuangahe, including a week in his home in Bacola. Um, Eric, uh, his colleague training was in, P in Pekiti Tersha, although he came up to the Inasano Academy with me, you know, that, that was where the after midnight group began. Yeah, you know, that's a different story. But, you know, so Eric is Pekiti Tersha and, uh, uh, Philip Sled Dog Jolinas, he's now, uh, I hope I don't get this wrong. I think he's the next highest ranking person after Grand Tuhan. Uh, he's in Canada. Uh, and it's a, you know, there's a, you know, a tricky dog is Pekiti Tersha. So there's a lot of Pekiti Tersha in the Dog Brothers. Uh, and there's a lot of Pekiti. Uh, it's one of the five systems, uh, major systems contributing in Asano blend. So I come, you know, a lot of Pekiti Tersha, you know, comes my way through these uh, different channels. Uh, mm -hmm. Vern Asano introduced me to Punungoer Edgar Salite in Tennessee in 1989, and there was some excitement there. And uh, yeah, I hear it. I became a uh, private student of his, you know, while he was, uh, he would actually, it was a really very special and wonderful time for me because uh, I was available during the daytime when Gurr went to do his lessons over at the Machado. So I would be the body that he would do his drills on. And then we would come back to my house for his life. And Puna Edgar was, would come down from uh, Glendale or Burbank, wherever. And um, he would give Guru his lesson and then mm. give me my lesson. So I got to watch the lessons that Guru Nasano had with Puna and Guru Edgar. Okay. And then it's pretty special. I, ha I have the footage, but I'm not allowed to reveal it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, but uh, it's uh, Puna and Gregor was something. I mean, it was incredibly non and uh, a real fighter's diagnostic eye. You know, I gave you the one story about, oh, hold your hand higher than his. And at the time, before he came in, we had three major knee shots. This is material I cover in combining stick and footwork. We had a uh, top dog's way, drift shot into, under the backhand. We had a uh, salty dog's way, drift shot under the roof block and take the knee on the inside. We had my way, which was half crescent again going to the peroneal nerve just like top dog did so we had three different knee attacks all of which had some success 
and uh, Punaguragar came in and he said, oh, this is easy. And he says, just while you defend and strike here, move this leg here. And that solved it. Isn't that? I know. Hang the leg. Hang the yeah. leg. <laughs> and so I've gone on to take that as my preferred and primary defense against the Muay Thai round kick. Ah. There's like I'm 68. My bones ain't as tough as they used to be, right. and I'm really I don't have the gusto for banging shins on a heavy bag the way that I used to. I used to think that was great fun. Yeah. Now I don't. Yeah, yeah. Um, so <laughs> you know, you know, it's you know. By the way, in the street, you know, there's a lot of big sturdy guys around you know here around Fort Bragg, and I'm you know like, do I really want to be shielding? You know, I got some, you know, 220 pound guy or something. No, I don't want to be shielding them. Uh, I want to be able to, you know, but boom. And the way you can spring back in, and I've been playing with creating two additional angles off of it. So of course, you can uh, and come back in as the, yeah. the kick goes by, but then you can also go here. Yeah. And you can go here. Yeah, diamond. Um, and so, you know, so that, you know, it's a more evasionary game. It, you know, it, real fights, I think, are more like a weaponry fight, like more, um, where what happens before the contact, what we call snake range and DBMA, is where you define what happens at the moment of contact. Mm. And that moment of contact, define, imp, dominating that moment is why Bruce Lee put his strong side forward, was to dominate the moment of impact. Impact. That's more important with weaponry fight. But if you're in a I can't lose fight against some guy 30 pounds younger than you and 40 pounds bigger, well, that's kind of the same thing. Yeah, it's very much, very much the same. So, you know, I don't want to play same weight division shielding games. So, you know, for me, so that, you know, the gift from Kunagur Egger of that cross step for me is completely pertinent no. in the empty hand context. Yeah. Do you remember you gave me something when I'm a 20 girl and I've never forgotten it. And basically what it was, was defense against a kick using the, the little tongue, little tongue hanging step. But what you did afterwards is this. And I wanted to see if this is something you still do. You know, I would hang, you know, you have a little tang, uh -huh. and then come back I'll in. the Dracula. Are you well, still I've doing been, it? Oh, I've been exploring the Dracula up the wazoo. I've got a whole bunch of stuff coming out of that. I still remember that you giving me that along with the metronome. Well, that's Bukti Nagar, Nagar Penjok Sea Lodge yeah, Zero number yeah. one. Come to find out from Burton. Right. Yeah. 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 I my form was hideous, but I like to, you know, like, you know, for me that's been gold. I use it in oh, many right. ways. Fantastic. Right. Because I still been using, it, but I wanted to know maybe if you put a spin on it or improve. Yes, I. Why? Yes, I have. <laughs> well, incidentally, yes, I <laughs> So, getting back to Edgar. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. So, getting back to Edgar, and you, you asked who my other influences were. So, I want to make sure I give a complete answer there. But let's oh, say sure. yeah. Edgar for the moment. Sure. So, you, you want to ask more about Punagor Edgar? Yeah, I got a question from um, a viewer, and he. Um, you know, you alluded to absolutely his attribute development, you know, and all that. But he wanted to know your relationship and the influence from him overall that he gave to you. I mean, obviously, you guys had a pretty special relationship, I'm guessing, you know. Um, I'd like to think so. Um, and, you know, the stuff he was going through with his family behind, and I, I produced and directed that first video. And he was afraid to do the talking because he's very shy about his English at that time. And I said to him, how many languages do you speak? And he goes, five. I said, well, most Americans don't even really speak English that well. You know? yeah. And I said, but you, you, you know, you, you don't want to be the guy who can't even speak English on his own video. He says, you've got to do the... Uh, you know, handle the English. And so I was able to put together the project in a way I think it looked pretty good, or, you know, for not, you know, uh, I don't, I don't think I made any money on it at all. It was kind of mm -hmm. a cover my, cover my cost kind of a thing. Yeah. And there was this great fight scene we did at the end. I think you can find it on YouTube somewhere. The man with the briefcase, I think we called it. 
and uh, the future hot dog and I, we play kind of a. You know, oh yeah, yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We play sort of like Beavis and Butthead meet the yeah. Brothers. Yeah, and uh, you know, Edgar's kind of the Clint Eastwood. He doesn't say a word. You right, know. he comes in, saves the day. And, yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> So, you know, helped them with that and, you know, helped them, you know, just, uh, you know, the money from that helped him be able to bring his family over and what that meant to him. And, uh, yeah, he came by to say goodbye to Guru Asano and me right before he was getting on the plane to fly back. And he had had a very scary, almost crash landing. And so for him getting on airplanes was a very stressful thing. And, um, you know, he went back to the Philippines and had the stroke and after a bit of time in the hospital died from it. And it's a huge loss. If you read his book, uh, The Masters of, I forget the order in which he was the arts, you know, Kali Scream Our Niece, the amount of people that he had trained with in, in, in the Philippines where, you know, here in America, there's much more openness and, and sharing or this, that. The, the, the arts still remain much more secretive than people have any idea. Yeah. There's some people out there who are not sharing their stuff and nobody knows about them and they're perfectly okay with that. Mm. You know, you know, you know, it's, I've been around enough to know they're there and uh, they're there. Incredible. Um, but, you know, so, but he could have been, was meant to be such a bridge of knowledge from the homeland mm. over to us. And to have lost them, you know, the way we did, apart from the, you know, the personal tragedy and, you know, the, the conversations he and I would have and the insights about things um, hard to describe, but very real, uh, you know, so for, but the larger Filipino martial art community to have lost him was huge. You know, there's a lot that's going to die with him. I know. And I look at the back, you know, and not, and I look at the back our group, like obviously there's people that are still doing some great stuff yourself. David's still teaching a group, uh, Roger, Dino, Perez, and all that. You know, some others, maybe I'm I'm not, I've missed out. But overall, generally, it's kind of like few and far between, you know, it, it's it's too bad. Yeah, yeah it's uh, after Puning, I think Leonard Trigg was given the... Was, he was. Okay, I, I haven't stayed current with it. I mean, it, it's just, you know, it, it's... I mean, Edgar trained me for dog brother fighting. So, and, you know, I learned some good knife from him as well. But um, although I regard Lameco as a system of great influence on dog brother martial arts, I wouldn't really regard myself as somebody to go to for learning Lameco. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so, you know, I, you know, I leave it to those guys, you know, good luck. Yeah, I just hope. I mean, uh, hopefully, hopefully, you know, as his children are of age, you know, that there will be a place for them to rise. Um, so let's see. So going through teachers, I had some um, valuable time with Tuan Chris Sayak and a couple mm. of other Sayak people. And so, yeah, the Sayak's a very different system. And uh, it was actually at uh, uh, one of my camps. I did for two years. I did camps at the Raw Gym in the early 2000s, where they first came out of where they had been hiding to start revealing their their material to the larger world. Um, so you know, very interesting system. Picked up a lot. You know, picked up things of genuine value from there that continue to be of value to me. Um, you know, there's other teachers. You know, it's not like I. Even a brief interaction is a value sometimes. Sure, yeah. Uh, Grant Tuangahe, uh, in, when I was at, at his home in Bicola, he I spent a day with a guy, Manon Kalimba. And um, just one day. But I, of lasting influence. I have a whole body of material that based around what I call the Kalimba. He had a, mm -hmm. he had a uh, very distinctive staff system. And uh, I use it a lot in the staff and in single stick. And in a certain sense, an empty hand as well. Um, and he also had heavy hands. Mm. He had a pawn and toucan for real. Mm. And he had a conditioning method for those hands, and they were heavy. And so, you know, so even, you know, one day there had an influence on me. You know, if I didn't give credit, I wouldn't be right. On the other hand, there's one day. What can you learn in one day? But you, your thinking could be changed. 
Yeah, yeah, right. Pick up a concept or a tactic. Yeah. yeah. So you're right. gonna see some one way of looking at it is learning doesn't take a long amount of time. What takes up the time is the not learning. Mm. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> Another one. Man, you Another got one. So yeah. um <laughs> Then of course you have to be intelligent with it. Yeah. And what's the de and what's the definition of intelligence? You the told me memory. You the amount, me that takes, the amount of time it takes to forget a lesson. So okay. if you have that insight and you forget it, well, didn't do you much good. No, because I but remember you have that in, in the insight of that moment of Satori, and then you hold on to it. Well, that one moment was of great and lasting value. Yeah, because um. Well, because I remember distinctly, you said a, a sign of intelligence. I'm, I'm, I could be off on the verbatim, but a sign of intelligence of somebody is their ability to remember. You know. All right. Yeah. So you know, and, and well, I, if that condenses to as intelligence is the amount of time it takes to forget a lesson. Yeah. So, all right. <laughs> <laughs> the fact I remember that. I mean, yeah, I'm impressed. I'm impressed. So, you know, the, I, I, these are the. For people who uh, on the third tape in the first series, the Sinawali tape, yeah. and it finishes with the man ape, he tosses the bone up and it, it's okay. floating up there in the air. And then for anyone who's like too damn lazy to get up and turn off the VCR at that moment, okay. after a long wait appears three questions. Uh, what is the definition of intelligence? The amount of time it takes to forget a lesson. Ah, uh, oh, here, I'm, I'm garbling it up. I forget the, I'm garbling the order, but I think I have the, I, may, I hope I have this right. First one is, what is the secret to life? Okay. Answer, the secret to life is to get smart faster than you get old. Okay. Well then, what is intelligence? Intelligence is the amount of time it takes to forget a lesson. Is intel Third question, is intelligence the same thing as wisdom? No, wisdom is choosing the right lessons. Ah. So you know, so for you know, fortune cookie stuff or whatnot, but you yeah, know, you know, I, think stuff. Wow. I think it's great stuff. Um, so let's just okay, another question, kind of um, somebody was asking to clarify, and that you're the head instructor of you know Dog Brother Martial Arts and the creator. What can somebody be a dog brother and be an instructor, both or vice versa? How how does that work? The Dog Brothers is an open architecture group. Okay. The Dog Brothers are a band of sweaty, smelly psychopaths dedicated to the proposition of higher consciousness through harder contact. Harder contact. Okay. <laughs> uh, a large number of people who have become Dog Brothers trained in Dog Brother martial arts. Okay. But whether you are accepted to the tribe or not does not depend on where you trained. You could have trained yourself. I mean, you could have trained with anybody. Right. But right. as long as you come in with proper dog brother spirit, you can aspire to become a member of the tribe. Gotcha. Gotcha. Dog brother martial arts started out as what I called me helping people to get ready to do dog brother real contacts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But over time, it, my teaching evolved into the Kali Tudo mm -hmm. and into the Dial S Often material. Mm -hmm. And so, the way I define the Dog Brother Martial Arts is the mission statement is to walk as a warrior for all your days. Okay. And and it has the three categories, the real contact, stick fighting, the Kali Tudo, the Dai less often. Okay. And so somebody, you, somebody can come to me to come to train in the system with one of the instructors that I've developed. Uh, and they could train. So I'm just interested in the stick fighting. Okay, no problem. Another guy is, I'm looking for an edge in my MMA. No problem. Okay. You know, the guy comes like, okay, I'm in law enforcement, and you know, I, you know, I've heard good things about your anti knife material. I'm a yeah. corrections officer. I've heard good things about your anti knife material. Um, I work um, number of times is scheduled to be working again with uh, border patrol. Uh, they can, you know, a, one of the the way they described it one time was uh, an intermediate force going intermediate force going up and down the force continuum. Mm. So, you know, to, to be a border patrol agent is a very tricky and subtle thing. All law enforcement is all street law enforcement work. People got very unclear ideas as to you know just the layers that, that can be involved. But with border patrol, picture being part of a team of two to four guys 
and you are on somewhere and out in the darkness along the Mexican border, and the nearest help is 50 miles away. You have three categories of problems that you're going to be running into in the dark if you're not stumbling into the cactus that, you know, a real, you know, real problem. The first category is like, okay, here's 30 people who are coming to be nannies and dishwashers and busboys and gardeners and, you know, you know, the, the kind, you know, good, decent people coming to work hard. Um, and among them are the coyotes who are not necessarily the good, decent people. Mm. And they're looking at a lot of money riding on what's happening here. The second category of people are, are the mules, the ones who are carrying the drugs. Drugs. Yeah. The third category is the rip gang. And the rip gang is one narco group looking to steal. <coughs> I was sweating a lot today teaching at the Vision Quest camp in a lot of hot, humid this, so I'm a little bit dehydrated. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's the third category is the rip game. So that's a, you know, those are, these are military, you know, often it's just simply a uh, corrupt unit of the police or the army. Mm -hmm. you know, you know, the game is played very hard. You know, sometimes the government becomes a paid agent of one cartel or another. Okay. Uh, and so there you are, the two to four of you out there in the darkness, and when you come up on something, you don't know which of those it's going to be. That's a pretty hellacious problem. So, so when I'm working with them, it's like, okay, you know, this, this, and that. Um, there's things about, like, how you approach, how you interact, how you frame things, how, oh, we need to escalate the force continuum. Like, okay, you know, like, okay, you know, I, as I'm laying hands on, I got to do this in a way if weapons appear. Or if somebody gets froggy from the side, how can I best go about establishing over this person without somebody jumping on my back? Okay. You know, things like that. Um, it's like, okay, do we have to go up to lethal? Okay, you know, once you know, once the guns are out, that you know, that's not I'm not a gun mm -hmm. instructor. But uh, you know, so for me that's my niche with with, with border patrol. And uh, I mean, one of the guys that I was working, I, this is at uh, Harper's Ferry, West Virginia, the Advanced Training Center, and a, a couple of, a few years ago, I was working, one of the guys there had been alongside Brian Terry when he was uh, killed by the Operation Fast and Furious guns. Uh, you know, so, you know, there's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm still in touch there, and how shall I put it, they're very confused by our current course of you know, direction from Washington. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, what, um, what did I say there? What do you, um, what are you doing? I said, what do you got going on? You touched upon a little your, your interaction, what you're doing with Sean, but besides, you know, I know you just recently moved to North Carolina, but besides the dog brother camps, and the gatherings you're teaching now are you teaching in a i teach five nights a week at vigilance and i have the uh associate the dog brother martial art association and my wife says you i thought you jews were good with money so a moment of advertising here uh, <laughs> people get too serious about these things these days i'm sorry i got one you know the other side of that equation is why did god create christians somebody's got to pay retail so we <laughs> and anyway, we've got to be able to laugh at ourselves, people. Oh really? My God. really? Yes, um, absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, I have the Dog Brother Martial Art Association, which is uh, thirty bucks a month or three hundred dollars a year. Okay. And you know, there's we're closing in on two thousand vid lessons. You know, some of them are just break breakdowns of the existing DVD, so you don't have to buy the DVD because it's in the library and a lot of them are just me teaching backyard okay. and you know just I'm teaching you know you know not holding back and um, you know so these three areas and how they interact and so the way I conceive of it is it's kind of like uh, a university you know when you go to the university you can have a major Mm. And you have minors and that you know Correct. things which everybody's got to take the core requirements and then from there it's the electives 
And okay. so it's not just the Mark Denny show. Uh, you know, Benjamin Girl, Benjamin Lonely Dog Rittner. You know, he, you know, a lot of his material is in there. And, um, the, you know, the forum is not just me pontificating. We got an interesting bunch of people in the memberships. So somebody can chime in with, well, you know, when we were clearing this guy out of the cell, this is what happened. You know, um, okay. you know so there's a lot of contributions from the membership. This is not just listen to me. Yeah, know. I got you. Okay. okay. Yeah, you know, so, um, which is really, you know, that would be really boring. Um, so the association is very much a happening thing. And so, uh, you know, I'll be working on some of the researching some things that I have Zoom class with, uh, including uh, some people from Europe and, and, and on the Zoom class. And I have a second Zoom class, which is for the instructors. And so, you know, continuously working and say, hey, check out this new way of teaching this or, yeah. you, know, you, know, you know, this and that. So, you know, like last week, uh, I, I put together the pieces together in a different way for the Kali Tudo footwork. And, uh, you know, really like what I got there. And, um, yeah, I really like it. You know, you know, so, you know, so share it and get the feedback or, you know, they ask, you know, it's like, I'll get a question. It's like, oh, I didn't realize that wasn't clear. And, you know, you know, so, you know, there's a continuing relationship, you know, the uh, Internet's an extraordinary thing. I mean, you know, I, you know, I grew up in the world before that. And just yeah, the yeah. way that something as particular as what I do can exist. Yeah, I couldn't support that. I couldn't sub do what I do if I had to depend on people just in one neighborhood. Yeah, right. No, exactly. You know, you know, so one of the things I did, and in, in, you know, it's the guiding force of the Dog Brothers is I was kind of the Johnny Appleseed. As I was doing the seminars in Europe, and you know, ben, you know, you know, I, you know, Benji came and trained with me, and I was really impressed with him. And uh, then he brought me to Europe and started building mm -hmm. on that and said, and I said, Benji, would you be the one to lead in Europe? He's done an outstanding job. Yeah, I hear. Yeah, you know, you know, Europe is, Dog Brothers is very strong. And they're bringing fresh influences. They have, a, a lot of them have also explored the, the HEMA, the historical European mm -hmm. arts. Yeah. And so that we're seeing in the Dog Brothers, we're seeing a lot of bucklers now. And you know, mm -hmm. so, you know, so that, you know that's, that's an interesting development. There's a, you know, there's always, there's this surging, you know, yeah, kind of just temporary. Right. The search for it is eternal, um, and so you know, I you know, just doing all these seminars because people's like, "How the hell do you do that?" Mm. And it gets to the understanding of the magic words: no judges, no referees, no trophies. Mm -hmm. One rule only: be friends at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Our right. goal is that no one spends the night in the hospital. Our goal is that everyone leaves with the IQ with which he came. Mm -hmm. However, only you were responsible for you. No, I got you. Yeah. no one for no reason, for nothing, no how, no way. Protect yourself at all times. Mm -hmm. All copyright to Dog Brothers, Inc. Um, and so one of the things with that control of the video is people know that they're not going to be put in a bad light. Mm. That, you know, so that is part of what it is. So no judges. The meaning of the experience is for you. It is not for others to declare what the meaning of that experience is. No judges, no trophies. You are not doing it for the praise. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Wow. It's, it's nice when, ooh, you know, that's cool. You know, you know, that's fun, but that's not the innermost, you know, that's not the drive. That's right. And no judges, no trophies, no referees. And this is big one. You remain responsible for your actions, mm -hmm. even in the adrenal state. In professional MMA, Mongo smash until referee pulls Mongo off. Right. The crowd right. goes wild. Are you not entertained? Right. We do not waste our IQ on such stupidity. We are not there to sacrifice our brain cells for the amusement of yeah, I know. whatever. You know, like if you're like, I'm rocked, I'm out of here. You know, like no one says you're a pussy to say, yeah, no, no, right. That's enough yeah. for today. Now, on the other hand, you don't want to wimp out too easy, yeah. but you know, but you know, but saying I'm rocked, there's no point in sticking around on this one. Um, or you, know, you might say, like, uh, you know, uh, you know, no more headshots, let me finish the rant. So, you know, you, you, you're willing to defend everything else, but you're just, you know, you're like, no more headshots, so you know, something like that, you know. Um, and so, because of those values. People cannot take the shot that doesn't shouldn't be taken. There's no way that 
you can define all the things that shouldn't be done. Mm. You just got to go friends at the end of the day. Yeah. And, you know, on some intuitive level, that's really clear because everyone is there for the respect of the tribe. So yeah. if you are some egotistical asshole who takes the cheap shot, you're yeah. going to lose the respect of the tribe. Right. And by the way, if that's the kind of person you are, that's the kind of person you think others are. And given how experienced we are at what we do, you're going to be afraid to get in front of us because you know we can break you. Right. Yeah. No, I think it's an important well. point, that last one. Because we get so good at what we do because of the values with which we do it, people of bad energy don't come because we're good at, we're really good right. at Right, you're good at problem solving. And <laughs> education will be administered should somebody, <laughs> um, you know, proceed from the uh, unsound ego. Educate, I like that. Education will be applied. <laughs> oh my god you call some great sayings oh my gosh um so uh so we're okay you know because we're coming to the end this is absolutely been wonderful um so what do you okay so what is mark uh, what's guru mark's future goals plans what do you got coming down the pipeline well right now the focus is on the camp i'm um <laughs> doing a lot of work with firearms uh, you know you know got pistol up to a certain point got the shotgun up at a certain point um and yeah, now it's time to start you know and i've begun work on the carbine i really la lag there um i want to be able you know a lot of a lot of serious military people walk in the door here at vigilance you know a lot of mm. green berets office of special warfare we had a you know a seal who just got restationed somewhere else but you know working with people like this is a real pleasure you know on a deeply satisfying level and um uh, so the more I can understand what, you know, the realities that, you know, they're thinking in terms of like, okay, you know, like when I was working with uh, uh, group five, special forces group five at Fort Campbell, 2005, 2006, uh, they said, where would you carry the knife? Because at that point, they're doing a lot of walking among the villages, trying to work, uh, win hearts and minds. And that's really... People think of Green Berets as super soldiers, but what they really are is trainers and educators. Mm. You know, they establish goodwill. They show people how to organize so that they can defend themselves from an oppressive government. You know, stuff like that. If you look at when you you look at the challenge coin, they oppress their lever from from, okay. from oppression, and you know they, that's what they're about. You know, and that's you know that core level. So they're like walking among the village, and so they're afraid if they just have the knife here somewhere, and someone comes up pretending to be friendly, and then grabs the knife and goes jihadi on them. Yeah. Like, in other words, where can I have the knife that I can access it that it's not visible? Okay. Where and where you know, or if where would they what would they call it? They call it the two a.m. wake up call. If we're going to snatch somebody in the middle of the night, we come crashing in the room. Sometimes in all the chaos. Somebody's up on us, and now the long the, the carbine is you know pressed between the two of us. If I have mm -hmm. you know, what do I go to from here? You know, where you know do I have the knife here? Do I have it here? You know, blah, blah, blah. where do I have it? Right. You know, so you know, solving problems like that. But and they put me in their kit, and for the kit that they were using at the time, which has changed since then, you know, we came up with what I think was a pretty good solution. Uh, but you know, so I need to have the basic familiarity of the long gun and the pistol and the and the knife and the transitioning between them and you know where to you know put them on the kit and so forth like that. So, uh, you know, I'm working on um, having some sort of thing where I have a, a a level of understanding that I can you know communicate with them and you know hear what they have to tell me. Okay. Okay. And, you know, looking to develop and, uh, the association and, uh, you know, we, uh, you know, we're, we're looking for a house with some acreage and uh, I want to have, you know, I get back to having a, you know, not just one Akita, but maybe two. two. And, oh, okay. Uh, okay. And mm -hmm. I want to have an owl. An owl? I want to have an owl. All right. And, you know, so that, you know, that's going to take a while to figure that out, the right piece of land, the aviary, and, you know, that I need to, you know, go through, be guided by people in these things. is like, mm. here's how you go about it. But uh, I've had a couple of uh, 
kind of mystical interactions with owls. Okay. In our nature. And uh, so in, uh, when I was in Ireland several years ago, they took me to this uh, eagle, hawk, falcon, owl place. And, uh, and there's some pictures, uh, you know, out there somewhere, but, you know, the you know, big thick gloves and I got this monster owl, you know, they're, they're, they're just very cool. And, you know, when you go into the office of this place, they got a smaller, but, you know, really small breed owls and they're just scooting about and this and that yeah. and tilting their heads in the way of owls and, you know, coming up and scratch me, scratch me. And, you know, it's it, you know, just, um, I want to have an owl. Yeah, right on, right on. Right. So, uh, so now, just for folks, I mean, that maybe, you know, most people know that you moved, but where in North Carolina are you located? Uh, well, I'm teaching at Vigilance Combatives in Aberdeen. Okay. Okay, Aberdeen. And that's by Raleigh? Or well, okay. it's an hour south of Raleigh. Uh, uh, like south five of minutes south of Raleigh. Okay, south of Raleigh. It's at the west end of Fort Bragg. West? Okay, okay, okay. And so, uh, you know, so the end that it's at is where the Special Forces folks tend to be. Okay. And so you know the you know the 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 community around here is uh, you know you know that's part of what it's about here. There's also mm -hmm. some big golf courses, country clubs, and there's um, for an area of this population some pretty good health care. Okay. And so forth. Yeah. So you know it's a you know it's a, you know it's not just a, a military economy. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Okay. Yeah. You know, you know, you can find, you know, in Southern, in uh, Southern Pines, you can find some like new agey hippie types and there's a hot asana yoga. Okay. And, uh, yeah. I like the, I like the hot yoga. You know, it, it, this is not the big room. I, I, the big room is like, wow, the heat's really good, but you have to do it exactly their way or they get really upset with you. Okay. Yeah. But I got a replaced hip here. You, you know, yeah. and yeah. You, know, you know, this place, they're just you know, like, oh, okay. Be, be, be yeah. yourself. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's very, very, you know, it's a very good vibes there, and uh, there's some pretty, you know, good, decent food can be found. Because the nature of the military at Fort Bragg comes from all over the country. You know, you know, so you know, you know, you know, people are coming. You know, you know, the, it, so there's a uh, and people who've been in many parts of the world. So there's a certain uh, worldly sophistication that can surprise. Okay. Okay. Wow. So what we got to do is we got to get you back on with Sean. So I think so. So I yeah, get Sean's a really interesting guy. Yeah, I know. I think the two of you guys can really actually. So what something I just like to throw out there, maybe a suggestion, and I think folks would really enjoy it when you and Sean come on, if you guys could actually even show some demos and stuff like what you guys do. You know, okay. I, think, I think folks would enjoy that, you know? Okay. So, um, Talk to Sean, but I can I can bring you guys back in as soon as July if you wanted to. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, that'd be great with me. You know, like maybe you know to help attendance at the camp. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like you, I know he's not known in the Filipino circles, but um, and I like to think over the years I got a pretty good reputation for spotting interesting people. Yeah, yeah, I, I would say that's fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Paul Bunak, Eric Knaus, uh, Edgar Salite. Uh, the Machado brothers, uh, 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 Lloyd the Young and I worked together for a time. We're not working together now, but uh, you know, certainly, you know, there was some very interesting interaction there, and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so you know, somehow I seem to run across interesting people. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So yeah, I mean, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll be in touch with you guys. I'll send another group message, but we happen to see Sean next. You know, run the idea by him. If a, if another Sunday night works in July pre-camp, we could do. You know. Okay. All right. Well, I'll, I'll talk to him. I should be seeing him uh, Tuesday night. Okay. 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 You know, so he, you know, he, he teaches. Uh, I I have I teach do the teaching on Mondays and Wednesdays. Uh, excuse okay. me, Mondays and Fridays. That's DBMA night. Uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays is the Krav Maga Combatives and DBMA night. So the, it's a 90 minute class. I get the last 30 minutes on Tuesday and Thursday. And then Wednesday night is sparring night. And okay. that's been a lot of fun, the sparring night, because um, I got some guys that I've been saying, like, let's do some Kali Tudo. Oh, and, okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> so that's the guys who are really bringing it to bear, some good athletes and uh, you know, good training attitude. You know, you, you, 
sparring part, you know, you want to have the right yeah, energy. Right. So you, don't, you, know, like, um, you don't want to be, you know, just, you know, having like, okay, let's see how much IQ I can make you lose tonight. Yeah, no. And, you know, it, it's not that, but, you know, but, uh, man, I got this one guy, I showed him how to get in the bolo punch. And he just every time he gets somebody with it, he looks over and gives me a wink, and you know, you know, just. Um, and uh, for those who are familiar with the terminology, a lot of work with the zirconia, and uh, a new position we call the halfback. And so, uh, in sparring, I give him an assignment. Your assigned mission here is to get behind him. Okay. 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 And because what happens is in uh, you know combat sport, you're only allowed to hit from in front. Mm, correct, correct. So your adrenal training does what? Says I must be in front in order to hit him. Gotcha. Right. What a stupid way to think. Yeah. Right. Like it's keep easier to fight behind. people from behind. A yeah, stupid yeah. way to think if you are looking to prepare for die less often. Yeah. So the mission has got to be from in front of him. How do I get behind him? It's mm. easier to fight people from behind than in front, particularly when, we particularly when weapons are involved or maybe. I, I would say, jeez. So, you know, so, you know, that's, a, that's one of the pieces of Kali Tudo. It's like, okay, how do we go at people so that we can get behind them? We can get behind them. Right. Wow. Do you think, yeah, so when you guys come, when you guys come on together, if you could show some of that material, I think the audience would love it. You know what I mean? Whatever you're comfortable showing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, you don't want to give too many of your secrets away, but whatever you're comfortable showing. <laughs> All right. Well, very good. That sort of feels like a, a good break point for tonight. Yeah. I really appreciate you coming on. Thank you so much. You know? Well, my great pleasure. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, you know, uh, I hope I didn't talk too much tonight. But no, it was fantastic. That's your no. That that was your role. Your role was to let us hear it. So yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, no, I'm I'm just really very happy here in, in North Carolina. My wife's happy. She's cooking up a storm. I'm eating well. Oh, and, fantastic! Uh, uh, got both our children with us. You know, my son's oh, one, and he's six foot four. He comes into the sparring class sometimes. And uh, my daughter just turned 19, and you know she's uh, she's working, and you know we're just uh, establishing our lives here. Good thing. Oh, Good I'm glad here. oh, that's fantastic. I'm glad that's working out for you. Yeah, and all that. But uh, all right, well I'll be in touch, sir. And you know, talk to Sean when you can. I'll I'll send a group message, and we'll make it happen. You know. The adventure continues. Wolf, wolf. All right. Thank you so much, Guru Mark. All right, Dean Wolf, good night. You take care. All right, so uh, <clears throat> yeah, not one in the books. So who is next? Um, I'm gonna have to check, but uh, uh, we have somebody really uh, special coming on Wednesday. I don't think there's anybody between now and Wednesday, um, and then we kick off with July's list, but I'll double check. But anyhow. If you haven't already, hit that like button. And if you haven't subscribed, subscribe to FMA Discussion on YouTube where you can see this interview and other great ones. All right, folks. Take care and good night.